Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Search Podcast. Uh, so, for today, I figured that I'd talk about um, something that's mainly related to surgery, um, although it has been validated in other places, I'm sure. But it's mainly related to surgery and a little bit of sports psychology, I guess. And it's our crisis in confidence in surgical training. So. Um, I read about the topic a couple of years ago, and you know I think that we, we fail as mentors in general. Uh, when I first started to read about the topic, one of the main things that came to mind was that there wasn't that much on it. In fact, back in 2008, uh, the only thing that I could find was this editorial. Um, and let me tell you, it's, uh, it's something that's uh, some food for thought. Um, I think that everybody should read it. It was in the Journal of Investigative Surgery. And the main reason why is because it was an editorial that simply told us why we need to be confident. And I'm not saying surgeon's bravado. Far from it. I think that, you know, the surgical bravado that um, some of my colleagues allude to and other departments uh, is not something that's directly related to confidence. And that's because very few surgeons are, in fact, confident. A more recent article, JAMA Surgery, talks about a confidence crisis amongst surgeons in general. And this is self-confidence. And that's the scary part. It's self-confidence. And it's an article looking at data from 2015 from an extremely validated, well-used score. And, you know, if, if you look at other industries, like, say, if you look at the sports psychology research, it's extremely hard to train an elite-level athlete if they're not confident in their skills. I would even argue that there's only two things that you would really need as a coach to be able to produce a really good athlete. And one of them is their skills and their confidence in them. The second one is that your athlete has to hate losing. And uh, I would argue that that's, those two are the main things that you would need. You know, that drive to not lose and to have an extremely high level of confidence in what you can and can't do. And some self-awareness, obviously. And so when, when reports from 2015 uh, quote us at only having about 50% of our trainees having some self-confidence, it's a bit of a problem. It's, it's, it's more than a bit of a problem. And when for the most part, uh, many people, when comparing that to uh, subjective scores, feel the same way, in general, that ain't good either. You, what you're really saying is that you're training people, but you're not sure how well they'll do. Obviously, academic centers have higher confidence ratings than other places, but there's a better and more important reason why that's important. And that's because if you look at longitudinal data over time, the institution suffers when surgeons aren't confident. The patients suffer, the quality parameters go down. Now, it might be a chicken and egg situation, but it's certainly something to look at and something that we can improve upon. One of the more interesting findings that I found didn't actually come from a paper that was designed to um, talk about how to build more confidence. More so, it was talking about why confidence is important and how to validate confidence scoring systems. And looking at that paper in particular, it's very interesting that simply by having mental imagery as an exercise, just by doing that, by going through it with your own trainees, and working on their mental fortitude and the mental imagery of the procedure that you're doing. You are going to improve their confidence. That's extremely significant and has been reported multiple times. So simply giving your trainees the exercises required and the supervision, let's be honest with each other, required. We don't just supervise in the operating room or at the bedside. In theory, we're supervising them a lot more over time. It, 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 that's that's the reality of it. Yes, they have to be more independent, and yes, that is valid in saying. There are numerous publications that say that the more independent your residents are, the more autonomy you give them, the better it is for them, and the better the outcomes are of your program. But we also have to be very honest with each other and say that some of our residents need some help. And when there's a significant number of residents reporting a lack of confidence by the time they graduate, that tells me that they need a little bit more help than we might think as mentors, or at least than has been advertised to us. 
simply by visualizing the procedure before and after and spending the time to do a play-by-play, -play, you're going to improve your resident's confidence. Very, 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 very interesting stuff, right? I wonder if we could do that for other specialties, like emergency medicine, especially when they're having a bad day and there's a mishap. Not that it's only emergency medicine people that do have these problems, but when you have a complication, like putting in a pigtail in the kidney when you're aiming for the chest, it would be nice if there was a debrief, but more importantly, a dedicated mental imagery exercise. I think that that's something to look at, just looking at the way that things are. There are other things that we can do before we end up at the bedside. So just looking at this article uh, from surgery in 2019, just a one day simulated boot camp where you looked at things like how to use an endoscopic tower which I'm sure anybody who was a resident back in the early thousands or 90s will tell you, we kind of learned from the nurses that we worked with, as opposed to from the attendings. If you, and I still think this, personally. If I want to know how the technology works, I'll buy coffee from my biomedical engineer. If I want to know how a ventilator works, I'll spend a day with an RT. Maybe longer, maybe less, but at least one day with an RT. If I want to know how to put together surgical equipment, or an endoscopy tower, I'm going to call in my specialist oper uh, operative technician or my nurse, because these are the people who do it thousands of times. They've dedicated their training towards it. So let's be honest, we could spend a day just teaching people how to use an endoscopy tower, a laparoscopy tower, a bronchoscopy tower, and how to get abdominal access. How to literally put in a Hassan technique or a various needle-based insertion of a laparoscopic port. And just doing those had an over 100% increase in your R1's confidence on July 1st. Just doing those. And we all know how tough July 1st is. For those of you who work on uh, the more eastern side of the Atlantic, July 1st is the unified day in general where people start their residencies. And it's oftentimes uh, one of the tougher days for most people. Uh, simply because it's tough starting residency. And I don't care if you're doing uh, a residency in ophthalmology, ENT, general surgery, anesthesia, ICU, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, you name the specialty, radiology, July 1st is tough. And I think that we can all remember how, how tough it was for us, especially because you know what you're supposed to do, but there are lots of first time things that you haven't done before, right? And it's, it's tough, it's not easy. So just having that one day boot camp where we have our best nurses go through how an endoscopy tower works, how our laparoscopy tower works. We have our best uh, RTs go through how our bronchoscopy uh, set works. We spend the 15 minutes per resident, 20 minutes per resident, Lord help me, 45 minutes if you have to just going through abdominal access with your R1s, that might be a very good investment. And it seems to mirror the same thing when it comes to senior medical student boot camps. Just having a boot camp where you take the time to go through what's expected of them, what an EKG looks like after a month or so of not looking at one. Because remember, it's not as hardwired when you're an orthopedics or a, a general surgery resident as it is when you are an R1 hoping to do cardiology next month as your first rotation. It's just not gonna be, right? It, you know how to do the basics, but you don't know how to read the borderline cases. And if you recall back to your R1 year, I'm sure that there were more than a couple of borderline cases in the first week or so, right? So getting that, that out of the way when you're a medical student and knowing that you just did a refresher on it might not be the worst thing. Okay. Again, there is no uh, quality indicator data that doing this with your R1s or doing this with your medical students is going to improve them significantly in terms of quality assurance parameters. I can't tell you that it's going to lower surgical site infections. I can't tell you that it's going to lower DVT risks. I can't tell you that it's going to lower operative times. But I can tell you that in a time when we spend more and more time limiting working hours, to increase quality of life of our residents, which is a topic for debate another day, we could probably improve their quality of life significantly with a one or two day boot camp. 
and having surgical, mod surgical education modules that are geared towards competency-based parameters will also improve that. So not during working hours, but during their own protected time, giving them access to certain modules that are competency-based. Not giving them a pat on the back, not making them feel confident because they finished a hernia with you and they did in record time. That's not how it's built. If you look at the data, it's very clear. It works when you give them targets and metrics that they can follow. It becomes even more important significant when you survey our examiners. Now, uh, full disclosure, I am an examiner for uh, certain boards. Uh, sometimes I'm invited, sometimes they are the local boards. And I can tell you, we as examiners feel very, 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 very robust in terms of our training, right? Because we did general surgery and then we tended to veer towards what we like. For example, trauma for me. I can never do a selective lymph node dissection uh, in the neck. I just can't do it anymore. I can find my way through a gunshot wound in the axilla, but I can't do an axillary lymph node dissection to the same level and degree that a person who dedicated his career in his life, or her career in her life, to breast surgery. It's just not going to happen. That's, 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 it's a fact of life. You know, forget about medicine. Uh, a sushi chef is not going to be good, as good at making a risotto or a pilaf as somebody who does that regularly. They're just not, right? It's human nature. Anything that's procedural is built that way. And yet, when you survey surgeons who are coming to examine people, there's a certain cutoff, I would say around about here, where, granted, the men more than the women, but where we tended to think that because we practiced eight to 10 delineated ca categories in our training field, we know everything. But anywhere down here, that confidence dwindles. The more specialized you are, the more difficult it is to say, it's easy, I know it. Some of it is building up the knowledge base. Some of it is also a little bit scary considering that we are examining people in that knowledge base, right? So another thing that might, might help us here is if we developed an awareness as examiners, of the effects of our own confidence on biases. And the authors talk about that too, which I find extremely interesting. The authors allude to this data saying that if I walk in thinking that I am just as good at dealing with that breast scenario as a breast surgeon would be, and I'm not saying that the breast surgeon should be examining it. The breast surgeon can write the breast question. The examiner should technically not know about the breast, but know the model answers. But for me to walk in thinking that I do may influence how I mark down my, exam my uh, resident, right? It's a little bit of a bias issue. Now, one of the things that I also think is quite important is not learning how to teach the first day that you're in attending. I think that it's extremely important for us to take the time to give residents workshops that teach them how to teach. I think my opinion is, if you're an R3, you should probably start being able to take residents through cases under supervision if you're attending. It should some be something that you should be able to do. Okay? And that doesn't just help your confidence. It also helps your feedback skills. It helps your knowledge base. It helps you pass your exams, just being able to do that and giving your residents that space to do that. Now, having said that, if I have an R3 who may not be familiar with the case or may not be familiar with the procedure, may be unprofessional in that lack of ability to make themselves familiar with it, I do agree with the attending that will take over the case. But again, topic for another day. For us to be able to give these cases also relies on confidence. Now, if you look at the way that residents assess themselves versus the way that we assess them, Residents are tougher on themselves than you will ever be as an attending. This has been in emergency medicine and surgery and other fields. They're tougher on themselves. They may not admit it to you, and they might try and be defensive, 
But when they go back home, they're tougher on themselves than you might think. That's most residents at least. Yes, some people need a good talking to, but those are extremely rare, we would hope. My concern is, when we look at how much we trust our residents, it correlates with their confidence. It actually does. So for us to invest in their confidence also builds up our trust in them. And again, food for thought. Bottom line is, in my opinion, this is a part of surgical education that we need to work on. And we might need some professionals to help us work on it. Some professional educators, some professional sports performance experts. And if you'd like to hear more about that, my, my, my feeling on sports psychology and how it can make me into a better surgeon, make you into a better surgeon, put a comment down below, I will get to it. I think that we need to have boot camps where we're not just assessing their competency, but also assessing their confidence. I think that we need to have exercises in which we become more self-aware of how much that affects us and how we self-actualize as surgeons. And this has nothing to do with bravado. Bravado, if anything, is more or less the defense mechanism that some of my colleagues put up. And I see it a lot more in, in other fields these days, which, again, topic for another day. So, conclusions. Number one, we should probably try and do a boot camp for our residents, or at least set up some sort of curriculum. It can be more than a day, it doesn't have to be more than a day. Clearly the data is very clear that one day is enough. Number two, we should be aware of that one resident who's having a bad day and needs that boost. Spend some time with them, go through the case with them, especially if you feel that they need it. It's not enough to just give them the feedback one week before the end of their rotation. It just is not. And it's not enough to just give them technical feedback. It should be geared towards them developing a better understanding of how they can be better. I think that we're just getting started on this stuff, much like this season of the podcast. And uh, I apologize that there are some technical issues. I'm still building up my own confidence and I'm building up uh, sort of resources to develop a slightly better production value. So confidence and hope do more for, than the physique, and that's the reality. Um, I'll leave you with this quote from Galen, uh, inarguably the prince of medicine. The man used gladiators to learn how the body works. He performed a pericardiectomy on a mediastinitis patient. It was insane. You should read more and more about him. There's a very good book called The Prince of Medicine, which I think is amazing. Um, shout out to some of my friends. Uh, Dubs as a local uh, provider of scrubs, as the name suggests. Um, they are phenomenal in that you can actually go take your scrubs from there, try them out, and if they don't fit, you can bring them back. It's a little bit harder when you've ordered them through Amazon.com especially when you consider that shipping costs a lot outside of Kuwait. And Vinyl Destination, who provide us with the music that you're about to hear. Um, again, if you're not bored yet, please like, comment, and subscribe. It helps me out a lot, uh, especially my confidence, as mentioned prior. And uh, hopefully I will be able to come up with more topics that you might like. Again, please suggest to this is Sarah Zaid. Thank you for listening. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.